Ladies and gentlemen, your MySQL program chair, Gene Myers. Good morning and uh, welcome to the biggest, best MySQL conference ever at the 2008 MySQL conference. Let's go! First of all, I'd love to uh, thank our Dyna sponsors, Kickfire and Zamanda. Please, a big round of applause for them. So, with that, I'd like to introduce our illustrious leader, Martin Mikos. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to the MySQL conference. It's great to see all of you here. Uh, Jay called me the last year's leader, but he gave me just 35 minutes this year. I'm used to having 55 minutes. I have the same number of slides, I have more guests, so if I seem stressed uh, and moving fast through the slides, you know the reason. So I'm trying to speak to the timetable, and it's counting already. Oh, I don't have 35, I have 30. <laughs> So if you think that I really make the decisions in this company, it's not really true. <laughs> so why did Sun acquire us? Many people have asked to explain it many times. To me, the, there are two basic things in a company that are very, very germane and deep into them, and that's the culture and the vision. And that is where I found the biggest match with Sun. We have similar cultures, we work from home, we're very technology oriented, we debate a lot, we discuss a lot. And we have a similar vision. The son always said that the network is the computer, and we always said that we want to be the best web database, the best online database. And that's why it makes sense. Everything else can be sorted out. We are working on integration, we're finding lots of opportunities, lots of challenges, we're fixing them. It's a lot of fun because there's a great great uh, affinity in culture, and we're very warmly welcomed at some. So, maybe I'm still in the honeymoon period, but I'm really loving it. So, as you all know, this is a one million dollar vote for the lamp stack, and that's just super impressive. It's a game-changing move in the industry, and we can all be proud that this is happening now. That all these years of hard work by you, by us, by others, has led to this. It's just amazing. Who would have thought five, six, seven years ago that this could happen? So what's in it for you? There are a ton of, of things that we are doing. We're integrating better with OpenOffice and we're figuring out how to run faster with Blastfish and all kinds of things. The, the number one thing we are working with Sun now, and we are part of Sun, is performance and scale. There's just an immense uh, breadth and depth of skill within Sun in how to make databases run faster, run on any operating system, any hardware, but run faster in terms of threading, memory management, I.O., all those things. And that's one of the key things we are working on. It will take time. Those things don't happen overnight. So it will take a year or two or three, and we'll see great results here. Also, for very conservative customers who didn't know that we provided global 24 by 7 support forever, they now know that it's provided through Sun. We can do it in any country in the world. We have a huge machinery for supporting large, paying customers, and we are getting many more big corporations now uh, approaching us and become customers. And then finally, I said we have a marketplace that is unparalleled in the open source world. This conference itself is as big as Linux world was just seven years ago. It's just amazing. We have 55 exhibitors, we have sponsors, we have over 2,000 people here. It's a huge marketplace for the tiny little starting entrepreneur, for the bigger company. We have big companies like HP and IBM here, we have small startups like Kickfire, and for all of this, it's an opportunity to not only work with open source and free software, but also make money and build a business that can pay your salaries, that can make you successful also in a commercial way. So, we are enjoying it. Uh, this is uh, April Fool's Day. We thought we should show our love for sun, so we inflated 500 pink and blue dolphins and, and spread them all across sun's Menlo Park and Santa Clara campuses the night before the 1st of April. So, so that's what we did. So, so we, we don't work all the time. And we also have to put our past to rest. So this is what you do with an S1 prospectus <laughs> if you are not going public. So we had this, this bonfire in Santa Cruz 
we took farewell of all those bankers' documents and great presentations, our stock ticker symbol, the S1, everything was there and we burned it. So here in the picture you see our CFO, Dennis Wolf, our finance director, Jeff West, and myself. It was a sad moment, but it was also a moment of leaving this behind and knowing we are now public, we are part of a public company. I need to be careful with what I say. I know there are many Sun PR people and lawyers here in the audience watching this. So <laughs> you know, not something I shouldn't. So the whole story is the web economy, what we are really doing. And, and if we look back at the bubble, and I've shown this slide many times to you in different forms, this is the net craft statistics of web growth. And we are now at in March at 163 million, but in April 166 million host names in the world. And the web just keeps growing all the time. And the bubble that we experienced, which was so dramatic, both for Sun and for us, but in different ways, is just a tiny little hump on this curve. So there's exponential growth that continues, and there's no end to the needs for new technology. At the same time, thanks to free and open source software, the cost growth is only linear for those participating. So an Amazon or a Facebook or others who you will see here, they're capable of scaling exponentially where, um, but keeping the cost growth on a linear scale, and that's what makes it so financially attractive for them. And and we now have a flat world where you can participate from anywhere in the world. You can build your software in Russia or China or Finland or the US and sell it anywhere. And, and there are many uh, systems where you have an architecture of participation, where it's built into the fabric of the business of the software, a way to participate, a way to contribute, a way to complain, a way to be happy, a way to be a partner. And we have all of that in our software. And it, many of, much of it is derived from the GPL license, which sets such, sets such a good foundation for architecture of participation. And you know that the motto of the Web 2.0 world is fail fast, scale fast, meaning figure out very quickly if your idea makes sense, and if it to everybody's surprise, including your own, if it does make sense, then scale as fast as you can. Hot or not, which the founders ultimately saw was a, a site of this type. They just started it because it was fun. Suddenly everybody loved it and they had to scale it very fast. And running on the lunch stack, it was possible. And there are many other examples. So, if it is true that the whole world is online, what are then the... How should you think about business? And, and this may be sort of a construction afterwards, but this is how I would explain the thinking of my experience. In, if the world is online, what's the best way to develop software? Well, it's open source, because then you can develop from anywhere in the world. If the whole world is online, what's the best way to deploy software? And you realize that software is not only running on your computer, but you are downloading it, you're connecting it to other computers, and maybe you run it in a hosted fashion. So maybe you run not only your application hosted in a software as a service model, maybe you are now doing platform as a service. And we'll hear later today from Werner Forgans of Amazon of the platform as a service. And with many uh, MySQL startups who are not downloading MySQL anymore, they, well they do it once and they upload it to Amazon's web services and that's where they run their stuff. And they can scale infinitely without having to invest in hardware. And then, if the whole world is online, what's then the best business model? And this is still an open question. And every time my skill makes a decision, or our group makes a decision on business model, somebody says it's stupid, and the blogosphere is full of comments on it. But we are experimenting with the best business model. We think it is a subscription-based model in this world. We are figuring out new ways, we are testing new ways of making money, because we always thought that it's good to make good money, because that allows us to grow arrange these conferences, hire more people to use more open source software. And it seems that the subscription model is a winning one here, but we also see advertising models and other business models that are specifically designed for the online world. And then finally, if the whole world is online, how do you organize people? You work from home. We have 70% of our employees working from home in over 30 countries, you have to travel through 110 airports to reach all of them. Many of them are here today, so I'm sure we have about 60 airports represented here today. 
and our organization is completely spread out. We have teams that span multiple continents. We struggle with time zone differences. We struggle with cultural differences. But at the same time, we get to hire the best people wherever they are in the world. That is a phenomenal competitive edge compared to anybody else who is located in one valley or one peninsula or one place uh, where they have to find their people. So, today customers have choice, and if you look at the market space, there used to be, when I grew up, the ISV market was the software market, and to be really successful, you had to be an ISV, and you had to sell to the ISVs. But that's not the case anymore. The majority of the world's software is still developed for internal use. So, so a, a choice for the customer is to build the application themselves. That market we call Enterprise 2.0. 2.0 to distinguish it from all the old client server mainframe stuff that we don't really play well with, but all the new web-based architectures. Then you can buy the application, and that's, that's the old ISV business where MySQL is selling our database as an embedded component. But there's a huge market now for buying the service uh, with right now technologies, Omniture, others who are selling software as a service and need enormous infrastructure to power it. And that market for us is a SaaS market, which we are serving. We are a very strong uh, vendor. And finally, you don't even have to buy this stuff. You just use Google or whatever on the web. So there's a lot of, of services for large corporations that are today available free of charge on the web. And this, we have seen this coming. There's nothing new here to anybody. But it's just a major, major shift in how the software world works. And where traditionally you would say that the highest availability or highest security was keeping the application within your company, we are not far from a moment where you get higher availability if you let your software run on somebody else's hosted network because they actually are even better experts on high availability or scalability. Those are major, major shifts that are happening. Sure, not everybody is jumping on this bandwagon yet, but, but the, the thing still applies. The, the future is here. It's just not widely distributed yet. Uh, but I do think we have it here at the MySQL conference, and that's what makes it so exciting. So, when you do this, this is maybe my most important slide today. Remember, it's your data. And Tim O'Reilly realized this. He said that data is the intel inside of the next generation of computer applications. And that's good news and bad news. The good news is that everything is revolved around data. It's fantastic of business opportunities for a database group like the database group of some microsystems. But there's also a danger that vendors will have a, an attempt to close the data, lock in you through data. And when you choose vendors, when you choose how to deploy your software, I'm really urgent to make sure that you hold on to the data because it is yours. And I happen to believe that running their data, storing your data in an open source database, that's a fantastic <coughs> example of how to ensure it stays open. Or open office with the ODF uh, uh, open document format ensures that you stay in control of the data you create and you own. So it's very much about the data, more perhaps about the data today than about the actual code that, that executes around the data. So, I always tell our engineers that we have three design priorities. This is something I heard from Monty and David when I joined the company. And we said, reliability, performance, ease of use. That, those must be our, our guidelines when we develop software. We try to stick to it. Every now and then we develop a new feature or something else that isn't on the priority list. But most of the time we focus on reliability, performance, and ease of use. So let me give you some examples here of how we do that. So on reliability, we are today releasing 5.1.24 uh, release candidate. It's an amazing release. We have fixed nearly a thousand bugs in 5.1 last year. And we fixed 386 in it already this year. And now I would like to ask anybody who has contributed a bug report or a bug fix or a peer review of a bug fix to stand up so we can see who you are who are ensuring the quality. So my skilled employees and others. <laughs> GA in October 2005, it didn't really, really meet our quality uh, uh, standards, and now afterwards we can admit it. 
With 5 1, we are much more conservative, we are much harder on ourselves. That's why we are now in release candidate mode. We'll get it up to, as GA by the end of this calendar quarter, end of June, but we take the, the quality aspect here very, very seriously. The next thing is performance. We always talk about performance, trying to optimize it, trying to improve it. It's difficult because there's so many aspects of performance. But even a small performance gain is enormous for a customer that may have 7,000 MySQL servers. If we improve their performance by 5%, they save so much electricity, floor space, hardware, and just maintenance that it's, it's an enormous savings. And we have used the DPT2 uh, benchmark now for our products. Maybe it's not the best benchmark, maybe it's a little bit re representative of the old world, but it's very easy to test against it. And I'm very proud to show you now that in 5.1 we have an increase of 10 to 15 percent compared to the 5.0 releases. So here you see the various 5.0 releases, and when we go to 5.1.24, in our DPT2 tests on medium concurrency, we see an improvement of 10 to 15 percent. And now I challenge all of you to test this, verify it. Maybe you get a better improvement, maybe you get a less of an improvement. And we want to know that because there's so many aspects of scalability and performance. We have measured one through the DVD2 test, but there are others as well. And then the third priority is ease of use. And when it comes to ease of use, I invite one of our uh, foremost experts on it, Mike Zimmer. Could you come up on stage and show us? The new MySQL Workbench GA as of this morning, available to all of you, and through thanks to Mike and his team. So, Mike. <laughs> when I did my old um, DBDS Final 4 project, we generated 1.5 million unique downloads, simply because people loved it, because it was so easy to use. And now, I'm very proud to be able to announce MySQL Workbench, it's the next evolution. And I want to give you a quick demo of that. So, um, what we tried with Master Workbench is even to, to make it more easier for you to use it. So, what you see now on the screen is a model I reverse engineered previously. And as you can see, we've added this very nice uh, model overview page which shows you all your objects, for example, tables, views, routine, routine groups. At the very top, you see the diagrams. So, adding a new diagram is very easy. You simply double click the Add Diagram button and you get a new canvas. Now you can use drag and drop functionality like this and like this to simply design your diagrams. Here is a little diagram I created and this is even a bigger one. So, let me zoom out a little bit. Like this. When you created your diagrams and your schema, you can then use the forward um, engineering feature to actually create um, your model inside the live running database. You can also synchronize your model with the database. That means if you do any changes in the model, then you can simply create your auto table scripts and let those run against the database. If developers do uh, a project like this, which, which is very large, then they usually have one major pain, and that is creating documentation for it. And with multiple workbench, we made it very easy for developers to actually generate um, documentation for it. So you simply go to the models menu, select the dbdoc feature, and this is a simple wizard that allows you to create an HTML report or a text report of your, of your model. So I've just heard one. This is what it looks like. So it gives you a very nice, clean overview of your diagrams, of your schema, there. And, and those can be used to discuss in team and um, with other guys. So as you can see, we really try to focus on, on ease of use. So if you still uh, write your SQL great scripts like this, you should turn around and smart <laughs> about it. <laughs> in the last few years in the MySQL ecosystem. And 
you remember in October 2005, we went out and said, the storage engine API is open, please everybody develop as much as you like, whatever you feel like, and get, go, get your innovative juices going. And today, we, we have a, just an enormously impressive list of storage engines for MySQL for a variety of purposes, some of these competing with each other, some of them complementing each other. Kickfire is launching here from Stealth Mode, their diamond sponsor, super exciting, SQL on a chip that you really need to have a look at. Infobright is a gold sponsor, we are now reselling their phenomenal column-based data warehousing engine. Uh, InnoDB, our long-term partner, also a gold uh, sponsor, we've renewed the contract we have with them in case you're interested, continues to be a fantastic and popular engine. Uh, PDXT from Fridays, they are speakers here, and they did not just one but two storage engines because Paul McCulloch thought that it's not enough with PDXT, we also need a launch streaming engine. So you should look into what they are, they're very advanced thinking on, on how to deal with unstructured data. Nitro Security, they are panelists here, they have a very fast data warehousing engine for real time news. Uh, additionally, we have ScaleDB and Tokutech as an exhibitor, as if this wasn't enough. So please have a look at those. Within our group, we have two projects. We have Maria, which we call Monty's Baby. Uh, it is an improvement of the MyIsen engine with uh, crash recovery and a vision of the future for all features that you can dream of in the best uh, storage uh, transactional storage engine. And then ourselves, we are developing uh, the Falcon storage engine where we have been working very hard for, for two years, removing bottleneck after bottleneck after bottleneck, two steps forward, one back, and then three forward again. Now we've tested on DBT2. We had superior performance with Falcon on 16-way, also 8-way uh, machines. Falcon is designed for computing environments with lots of CPUs, lots of cores, and lots of main memory. It's still uh, beta software, it's inside CXO, which is alpha software, so not ready to ship GA, but very exciting uh, things here. And who knows, this is open source, so maybe there are more storage engines and I'm just not aware of them, because you might be developing things secretly somewhere, and maybe you do like Mark Atwood, who developed the storage engine that links against Amazon's S3 servers. <coughs> Anything is possible here. So when people ask me to talk about technology direction, I don't know, because I'm the leader of an open source group and innovation happens elsewhere and I have little control over what really gets innovated. But what we are focusing on, if anybody asks me, is scale. We are known as one of the fastest databases, but all our customers say, Martin, give us more scale, more performance, more scalability, read scalability, write scalability, uh, scale out, scale up, sharding, whatever it is. There's an enormous appetite. And I guess this is like being a, uh, the producer of Ferrari. No matter what models you have, your customers always want more horsepower. And we'll be continuing to focus on this. We'll work very much with data by the SPL standard or not. We today offer support for Memcached and there are other non-SQL ways of dealing with data that are becoming increasingly relevant. And the database and the data, you may not run just as software. Maybe you will run it as service. Maybe you want it. Maybe you don't want to download it, you just want to use it. So go to DB for free, for instance, and you can run 6.0 there without downloading it. And then we're building this architecture participation where we are opening up our procedures, inviting people to our meetings, to, our, uh, to see our workload entries, whatever we do. Uh, we have a, uh, still a lot of work to do here, but I think we are making good progress in just inviting everybody to participate in the work and building a strong, strong ecosystem. Because there's no other database in this market that is capable of doing it today. So now I would like to introduce our next demo. <laughs> this is uh, Rich Green. I'm uh, forbidden to call him my boss, so I call him my son visor. He's the guy <laughs> who makes sure I'm well taken care of that son. And uh, Rich, welcome on stage. Thanks, I'll press the page now for you. <laughs> Jonathan and I, the staff, as well as with the Sunport directors, 
was to ensure that autonomy reigned supreme with uh, the MySQL organization. That was critically important uh, for MySQL to be uh, able to continue on their same course and speed. Uh, we use the term that most sons chief engineers use, which is uh, the plan is the plan until there's a new plan. And there is no new plan. So um, it, it was critically important to continue uh, the way we're going. And as evidenced by that, when Martin asked me to speak briefly up here, um, I said yes. And he said, you have two minutes. And I said, yes, madam. So um, I'll be very brief. If you can flip the uh, slide there. Uh, just very quickly with regard to uh, where we have come so quickly in the last two years, uh, since John uh, uh, took over leading the company, we have radically changed what we're doing. So in case there's any question or doubt about the comment about autonomy, look at this chart. This is what Sun Software is. This is what Sun Microprocessor is, which is um, many partners in the microprocessor. Uh, uh, I think many people thought that hell had actually frozen over when we announced deals with Dell, IBM, Intel, uh, and, and, and others. And uh, the amount of open source, focusing on GPL V2 when we released um, uh, the open JDK, open sourcing of all of our technology, the enormous growth of NetBeans and Glassfish and others, it, it all fits together uh, perfectly. As, as Martin noted, the cultures, uh, the discourse, uh, the intellectual arguments that go on inside of Sun and now across the organizations, it's, it's really a healthy uh, and excellent match and incredibly beneficial to Sun as well to bring an enormous new community together. So, um, I, you know, I, I thought about uh, putting up a first slide that is the famous book, Don't Panic, right? Uh, because it, it really is uh, the full intent. Uh, it would be it totally included for Sun to uh, bring these folks on board and then change what has been such an incredibly successful uh, path with communities, with technology, with development. So if you flip the last slide just real quick. Um, so here's our commitment. Um, uh, we are going to continue with what has been uh, occurring so far. It's all about free and open source uh, software. The ability to reach developers worldwide, to reach deployers worldwide, to ensure that every new deployment has the opportunity to use uh, MySQL technology, other free and open source technologies from Sun, uh, is, as I said earlier, the plan. And we'll remain with GPL. This is uh, something that I think we uh, made very clear when we released Java and GPL v2. And I think you've heard Martin and Jonathan and I talk about considering over time GPL v3 as an option as we understand how that all evolves. And uh, we're going to stick to those uh, uh, plans or non-plans as we, we understand the interest and evolution of the community. We have an enormous uh, organization inside Sun that we we did a uh, course correct on about 100 individuals who have 10 years of expertise in tuning and optimized databases that suddenly have a new challenge, right, which is uh, working with the MySQL team to build uh, incredible optimizations on the Linux platform, on, on the Windows platform, on Unix platforms, as well as on the Mac and others, uh, to make sure that we can take advantage of multi-core designs, uh, multi-socket designs, and get the most performance out of the platform. So that is going to be the big technical addition that we bring to the table here. And, and finally, there are other combinations that we can uh, see with partnerships, as evidenced by the last slide. We have changed our stripes completely in terms of our ability to partner well with others. And following uh, Martin's lead in the MySQL organization, we're really going to be very aggressive about ensuring that we're as inclusive as possible with the community and with other partners to, to grow the uh, you know the web economy through MySQL. So I just wanted to uh, make sure you all know where we're coming from here, why we proceeded uh, as we did, and where we're headed, uh, which was where we have been headed with MySQL. Thanks. Great. Thank you.